And so that's right, right then and there is when I set the goal to become a national champion. And so my senior year, we come back. And I, I say we come back. We didn't leave. <laughs> my senior year, I was right on pace to achieve my goal. I was ranked third in the country about middle of our season behind one amazing female swimmer who I knew very well. Because like in most sports, your top tier athletes you know of each other regardless of where you compete in the country. And so this girl who was in second, I knew. But the person in first, by body lengths, I had never heard of before. And so there was a lot of red flags. This was someone who came out of nowhere their senior year. There was no history of, of this Leah Thomas person in, in USA Swimming Database. Um, they were a senior from University of Pennsylvania posting the fastest times in the 100 freestyle, which is, of course, a sprint, and all of the freestyle events in between till the mile. And so if you think about this in terms of your, like, Olympic runners, this person we were seeing is essentially the same as your, your best 200-meter runner being your best marathon runner. Those are totally different systems, but that's what this person was in swimming. So again, lots of head scratching, talking to my coaches, my teammates. We had no idea who this person was until an article came out disclosing in a blip of a sentence, Leah Thomas is formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team. And the article continued as if we were supposed to just read right over this fact. And so I, I was shocked when I read this. Of course I was shocked, but I was really relieved because I then looked up who Will Thomas was, because I was curious. Was this a lateral movement? Was this someone who went from ranking first, now continuing to rank first, which of course it wasn't. This was a mediocre male, ranking 462nd in the nation among the men the year prior, to now again trailing the women. And that's why I say I was relieved, because I thought the NCAA would see it how I saw it, how my coaches saw it, how my teammates saw it, how my parents saw it, how anyone with a brain would see it. But that is not how the NCAA saw it. They saw absolutely nothing wrong with allowing Leah Thomas to compete with us in the women's category. And so I got to personally witness and, and feel the effect that this infringement, this injustice had on myself and my teammates and my competitors. It might seem as if I've been some lone voice and lone face fighting for women's sports, but I can wholeheartedly attest to the tears that I saw from these girls who placed ninth and 17th who missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the extreme discomfort that we all felt in the locker room when you turn around and there's a six foot four, 22 year old biological man undressing fully intact with an, an exposing male genitalia in that same area where you're undressing. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the grumbles and the talks and the whispers, because that's what they were, they were whispers, of anger and frustration from these girls who, just like myself, had worked our entire lives to get to that meet. Um, and so that first day of competition, to no one's surprise, we watched this man win a national title in the 500 freestyle, meaning becoming the fastest woman in the 500 in the entire country. Beating out, let me, make no mistake, he was not competing against scrubs. These are Olympians. These are American record holders. These, this is the fastest meet in the world beat everyone in the country by body lengths. And this is a sport that's measured down to the hundredth of a second. So to have one person beating every girl in the country by multiple seconds is a rarity to say the least. And so that next day of competition was the 200 freestyle. Um, Thomas and I, for those of you who don't know how swimming works, there's prelims and then you have to qualify for finals. And so we swam prelims, qualified for finals, top eight. We come back that evening, we raced. And almost impossibly enough, we tied. We went the exact same time down to the hundredth of a second. I know, it's kind of impressive to, to tie a six foot four man, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we tied. And so we get out of the water. We go behind the awards podium where the NCAA official looks at both Thomas and myself and says, great job, but you guys tied. And we only have one trophy. And we're giving this trophy to Leah. And so I, I was, of course, taken aback by this. And I asked why, which was the first time anyone had questioned anything the NCAA had done thus far. And they didn't know how to answer this. Uh, uh, well, we're just doing this in chronological order. OK, well, G comes before T. So now what? And they said, well, 
Leah has to have the trophy for photos. Um, we can let you pose with this trophy, but you have to give yours back. Leah takes the trophy home, end of story. And so this is ultimately what thrusted me over the edge because I knew the unfair competition was wrong. I knew the locker room was wrong. We all did. But when they reduced everything that we had worked our entire lives for down to a photo op to validate the feelings and the identity of a male at the expense of our own, that's when I was done. Up until this point, I was waiting, desperately waiting for a coach or someone within the NCAA or someone with political power or a parent or some other swimmer, someone to say something, someone to stick up for us, someone who was supposed to be protecting us to protect us. But I realized that's not what we were seeing. And so it, it, it slapped me across the face in these brief moments of, of us, you know, standing on that podium. Some of you might have seen the picture where Thomas and I are standing there and I'm totally glaring at him. <laughs> these are my thoughts. Um, it slapped me across the face that if we as women, we as female athletes weren't willing to stick up for ourselves, we couldn't and we shouldn't expect anyone to stick up for us. This has to come from us. And so um, that's, that's really what, why I'm here. I am. Um, I entirely, when I, when I took this public stance, felt unequipped for what I'm doing, and I still feel extremely unequipped for what I'm doing. Clearly, I'm not a public speaker, but um, I knew it would be a disservice to not just myself, um, but the past female athletes who fought relentlessly for Title IX. Of course, the present female athletes who are, are silenced, and, and of course, that next generation of female athletes who doesn't yet have a voice or who, who don't yet understand the implications of what this means for them. Um, in regards to the silencing, that's a piece I want to touch on.